Добрый день, коллеги. Меня зовут Дмитрий Скутин, я программный директор 100 плюс Технобилд. Я хочу представить вам нашего следующего спикера. Это Джеран Любин. To you, our next speaker is Jaron Lubin, a partner in SoftD Architects, the bureau of which has made a wonderful waterfall in Singapore in the airport, the bureau which has designed. Uh, Marina Bay Sand, uh, and uh, we are very happy uh, to see uh, that Jaron may uh, give us an open uh, lecture. Uh, let us hope that we'll have many questions for him to be able to share his experience with us. Jaron, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, let us start. Let us start. The floor is yours. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm really, I'm really sorry I can't be there today. And uh, but it's kind of unique within this time that we can communicate on these technologies, and I can feel like I'm in the room and I see you and I see myself. And um, I hear the translation right now, so I'm just going to try to turn down my sound. Uh, да, мы сейчас uh, разберемся, сделаем так, чтобы, uh, чтобы вам не было слышно перевода, чтобы не накладывался звук. Okay, so today uh, I'm very pleased to share with you some thinking, um, and thank you for the invitation to, to join. I think that any opportunity to for a talk for, for me is, is one that allows me to have time and space away from practice. Джеран, я прошу прощения, сейчас мы, к сожалению, не слышим перевод. Um, but, but actually, before I begin, I'll give you some background, a little bit more background on uh, the kind of environment that we work within. And, and recently, I've been thinking a lot about just not what the principles of our office and of our, our, of our thinking about architecture, where did it come from? And of course, uh, Moshe started his career uh, 50 years ago and has created a practice. And I thought that might be interesting to go back to the origin story of sorts for Moshe Safi and for Safi Architects, where I'm a design partner with uh, the team here and the rest of my partners here, and talk about the environment that created us, and maybe to seek out some principles and some concepts and some thinking that um, troubles us as thinkers, um, that, that we're calling out today as, as something that maybe as a profession we can do better, but by looking at the past, by examining and mining the past. So here's a picture right here uh, of um, Buckminster Fuller, uh, Luke Hahn, both great thinkers, Luke Hahn, the architect, Buckminster Fuller, the engineer, uh, um, inventor, radical thinker. And in the middle circled there is Moshe Safi, I believe he was 26 years old at the time. This was in the 1960s. And the reason why I love this picture is because for me, it's a perfect depiction of the way that uh, Moshe was, let's say, shaped in his career or partially shaped by these two really brilliant people. Now, Fuller, as we all know, but I'll explain a little bit, had ideas of systemizing society. He had ideas about improving uh, the world through engineering and design for all of humanity. And those ideas spread across not just architecture, 
but with and housing and hum all the facets of humanity, how to solve the food crisis, how to solve homelessness, how to solve um, national urgent issues and international urgent issues of the day. At the same time, Lucan was this foremost 20th century uh, architect who, uh, one of the best of the 20th century, thinking about what does it mean to build? What does a building want to be? Um, how do you actually approach from much more of a um, functionalist utility and also artistic point of view what a building can be rather than, um, you know, much more, what, I mean, really defining capital A, as we say in architecture, the capital A architecture, something more than just a building. Need this advanced slide. So the two of these thinkers side by side and Moshe as being shaped at the time to us represents something. This is a diagram that I created that, that talks about the idealist humanism approach to thinking, not just to architecture, but to thinking of the time and swirling around the centerpiece of solving the urgent issues of humanity through design, architecture, urban designing, urban planning, landscape, and the arts, was a whole um, universe of other disciplines and professional thoughts, whether it's technology or education or research or the program or policymakers. But all at the center was this visionary, idealist, humanist thinker. And sometimes these were architects, but also sometimes these were artists or furniture makers or landscape architects. But there was the ability for these folks to pull each other together, to pull, to call in uh, many um, uh, partners and collaborators to think together. This was a real moment. And the moment, I think, consolidated around a, a wonderful expo, a world exposition. Uh, one of the greatest expositions, in my opinion, Expo 67, which took place in 1967 in Montreal, Canada. In fact, um, uh, it was, I was just reading the history of this. I did not know this until last night that it was originally planned for the USSR. And then at the last moment, it moved to Montreal. This was a very interesting coincidence that I'm speaking today to you in Russia, modern Russia. So any expo, any international exhibition was about celebrating the joys of humanity. It was about celebrating technology, economy, um, visionary thinking, and actually expos to date, world exhibitions were a moment of rolling out new technology, about rolling, rolling out new ideas. And um, this expo was no different. Um, it was truly a marvel of a coming together of visionary thinking. Um, 50 million people went to this expo. It was, it was the first expo where rather than approaching pavilions from a nationalist perspective, each pavilion representing a various country and the country's interests, there was many more pavilions here that were focused around um, visionary thinking, new technology, new ways of solving problems. And in fact, the entire expo was more uh, geared towards people. Uh, the title of the expo was Man and His World, originally titled Man and His City, later developed and evolved into Man and His World as the expo planners were developing the conference in the expo. And so, um, Many of the world's greatest thinkers came together to plan this, this particular uh, piece of the city. In fact, any expo is really, and this is built, purpose built for, for, for the event. It runs for about six months, so it really needs to operate as a city. It has its own transportation systems, its own road networks, and the urban design itself needs to be thoroughly considered to accommodate all these very poor shadowing um, technologies and, and, and uh, forecasting um, urban design ideas of the future. So it's really looking ahead and it's trying to picture something that 
and, and try to provoke and inspire everyone who visits. And wonderfully, Moshe Safdi, in growing up in this medium, this environment of idealism, he's in college, he's developing his college thesis at the time. He's a young architecture student, and he develops an original proposal in 1964 called Habitat. And the original Habitat proposal, I have many pictures of this, it's, uh, it's this wonderful idea, which is a reaction to um, increased density in the city. How do you house civilization? How do you, how do you improve the quality of life, not just for the uh, wealthy, but for everyone? How do you um, distribute and create a wonderful living environment that currently, in his mind, just didn't exist? And so there was this idea of collective living in a way that was different than living in a bar building or a point tower, which was the predominant um, typology of building of the day, or living in the rural, the countryside in a single family house. He was taking the principles of both of these worlds and combining them to create something new. And further to that, he had these ideas, which were taking the latest industrial production and prefabrication, where these um, ideas could be systemized, they could be industrialized, and they could be created in a factory, um, and that the geometry of these things could be shaped perfectly with industry and engineered with all the collaborators around where the systems could be integrated in so many ways, and um, that they then could be brought to the site, stacked as an aggregate system, and stacked in such a way where you could actually point to your home and you could have an identity for your house. You say, that's where I live. And you could say, you know, I have my own private garden because one of the amazing pieces of this project was that every, homes, uh, every home had its own private terrace, which was the roof of one's neighbor. So this is, again, a, a very young team, 26-year-old architect thinker with visionary ideas coming together around the um, Expo 67 and developing very much so a first project. And, and every, as everyone could imagine, the kind of um, ambition and drive for an architect's first project at such a young age, you're going to want to solve many, many things. You're gonna to want to rethink and reimagine what a house can be. And so, you know, whether it was rethinking the kitchen or rethinking the orientation and indoor-outdoor in a relationship, or whether it was rethinking the uh, bathroom, there was a prefabricated state-of-the-art bathroom, rethinking the windows, there was new window systems where, we were, where Moshe was working with industry there. And so there was much reimagining and, 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 and much engineering too. It took the greatest minds in engineering to think about how only do you fabricate these components off-site, but also how do you bring them appropriately to the site lift them in place and structure them together to the greatest benefit. And so looking to the we find pictures of the factory and of the process of the creation of these modules, concrete modules, five inch thick walls created in the factory and then brought to the site, placed it into position and um, finally fit in place as a kit of parts. And the motto of Habitat was for everyone a garden, because like I mentioned before, every uh, unit owner, every resident, every inhabitant of Habitat in Montreal has their own exclusive garden with amazing views of Montreal with beautiful planting and greenery. And it really feels like you're part of a collective. This was also a time that was quite unique. Moment. Moshe was on the cover of Newsweek magazine. Within this Newsweek magazine, there was an article with the greatest architects of the day. Uh, they were talking about architecture and this way of urban planning and design. Some thinking the way you could think about design solving the woes of humanity, including housing, as the shape of things to come. And Expo was widely um, uh, in the media. It was on TV, 
it was in Life magazine and others surrounding Expo, including Buckminster Fuller. This was the American Pavilion. He created this wonderful, uh, this wonderful geodesic dome as part of his contribution. These were, uh, and 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 this was also, by the way, and I'm a big Buckminster Fuller um, enthusiast. Uh, he wrote in his text, "Utopia or Ob Oblivion." A goal. The goal is to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. So this is really inspiring stuff. It, it's, it's, it represents, like I say, a spirit of the day that I think is, is quite uh, motivating and inspirational. And at the time, too, architects and these thinkers were larger than life. Uh, Buckminster Fuller himself, together with an enormous model of, of this idea of this geodesic dome, which represented um, not only a singular project, and this is important for, for me, at least, in, in the thinking about this, but kind of a, a, a masterwork and a kind of overall way of thinking beyond a singular project, but about a project generally that could extend to different places, and different program and, 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 and actually could be picked up by different thinkers, not just the uh, kind of author himself. And the hero architect didn't exist as singular entities. Architects came together in many forms and in many collective fashions. In 1970, this is a photo from the follow-up expo in Osaka. Moshe Safdi is here seen together with members of Archigram, another uh, collective. Uh, Kirakawa is there, a member of, so, uh, of the Metabolists. And uh, Hans Holine, Yona Friedman is, is in the back, um, way in the back there in this, in this photo, amongst many other great thinkers. There was, uh, this was a time of, of movements, of congresses, where uh, architects would create opportunities and platforms to come together um, who could bring research to the table, who could talk about the future of the city through manifesto, through their own, um, let's say, collective desires to improve the world. And so it was very much about individuals coming together collectively to think for the benefit of everyone. And, and these groups included um, Margaret Graham, they included the Metabolists, um, there was the Congress known as Siam of all these wonderful, great, the best architects of the day coming together. Team 10 was, uh, of course, uh, an, out, an outspurt of, of that as well. Uh, once again, looking back to define moments that may be relevant uh, and just interesting to think about again today, there was a, a great exhibit and book um, uh, an exhibit at MoMA by uh, Bernard uh, Rogowski, Architecture Without Architects, uh, a kind of study of non-pedigreed architecture. In other words, um, Rogowski was quite uh, funny, I think. He uh, made several statements in his introduction to, the, um, to his uh, MoMA catalog, which described wonderful architecture existing um, beyond the timeline of the last 50 years. And let's say kind of tongue in cheek criticizing historians and thinkers for only looking within the kind of relative context, their friends, their fellow thinkers, but not looking way back uh, 50 centuries, millennia of thinking of shelter and the evolution of how we house humanity and what technologies drove that, what, what principles and what cultures drove that. Um, Again, the modernist movement was about principle and manifesto, but maybe there was something deeper about the evolution of thinking of housing humanity. So after that tremendously long introduction, uh, Moshe, we're, we're returning maybe back to the to the, to the fairly recent time, which would, let's say, put this back towards 1960s, 1970s, where Moshe's traveling around, and it's not just Moshe Safdi, and, um, but it was uh, many, many 
thinkers of the of the middle of the kind of later middle middle of the 20th century looking at how we house society you either have on the left hand side high rise housing uh, which let, leaves much to be desired we could say and then on the right hand side you have the variation which are those who uh, depart the city who, who move outside the city or city adjacent to have their own property um, these are these were the kind of common typologies within that space Next. And, and so reflecting on what was existing and what was at the moment, but also um, uh, these, these great collective um, uh, uh, movements, um, there was inspiration around, around the world. You had uh, in this letter a note from Lyndon B. Johnson to uh, Moshe Safdi requesting uh, a Washington, D.C. demonstration project uh, of, of the principles and systems of Habitat 67. And it, Moshe worked with his team and then convened a meeting in Washington, D.C. with the Housing and Urban Development Board and created a wonderful presentation of research within four to six weeks, repackaging the systems thinking of Habitat towards a broader goal of creating a, a systemized uh, production of housing that could be rolled out across the United States. And so systems and principles were developed for different scenarios, whether it was the single family house where there was panel systems that were designed, or whether it was the stacked mid rise or the high rise structure, all utilizing the same systems approach, but then reconfigured based on the context of the climate the situation, the density, et cetera. And these all led to many habitat solutions. So, I, I, um, but this is a technology conference, so I'd like to return for a second to talk about technology, which is to say technology um, as opposed to the evolution of, let's say, typology or architectural thinking research, technology moves very quickly. Even within the last 25 years, what a phone has meant, for instance, has changed significantly, both the technology itself and the look and the shape, the form of it, but also what a phone does. You know, everyone recalls their favorite mobile phone. Um, I myself had a wonderful phone after seeing the Matrix movie, and I wanted to have the Matrix phone. But And then now I think about the iPhone, which takes um, all the ideas of camera and calendar and, uh, um, you know, GPS and telecommunications and internet. Basically, we cannot live without this technology. It's created this, this convergence of all these utilities towards a singular device to help us out. And I think that this way of thinking is very interesting as you put it side by side with architecture and urban planning. I put here an image of Habitat on the left-hand side of the screen. Habitat 67, as I presented to you earlier, side by side with a project also called Habitat in Toronto uh, that was uh, put out uh, by another architecture firm only two, three years ago. So this is a 60-year time span between two projects, but we have not uh, evolved in terms of the way we are thinking about housing tremendously. In fact, the new habitat leaves much to be desired. It's, it's a different system. It's not, it's not fabricated. It's not built around the idea of from the inside out. The unit types are, um, are, are um, a little bit less well organized than they should be. But let's say a thousand years back or 1500 years back, we could also criticize ourselves. Um, we have not moved a lot. This is a Hilltown image from Rodolfsky's architecture without architects. And the, of course, Habitat 67 was a wonderful uh, modernist idea. All architecture students study it, were continue to be inspired by it. But, you know, where else can we go, not only singularly as an architecture firm and as thinkers, but collectively to reimagine the way that we approach housing for humanity? And within our practice, 
we've just spent a little bit of time over the last uh, uh, several months mapping out all of the various evolution of housing projects and of habitats that have occurred from 1964 through to modern contemporary times. And it's quite interesting that while the uh, typical way that you might um, reference the qualities of a, um, a building in the city, a housing in the city might be around how tall it is, uh, we need to define, let's say, a separate metric, something that rethinks the typology and how you uh, map it and understand its qualities and understand one to the other and make sure that you're continually moving in, in, with forward progress in the evolution of thinking so that every project for us becomes a project where we're testing something anew for, for the next. And so maybe uh, one way of mapping a qualities of projects rather than let's say just quantity maybe to understand the density versus the amount of outdoor space. And so we did this quick mapping of several projects that we have on the boards or, or on, underway, some mixed use, some dedicated housing, where we took the FAR on one time scale of the graph and then took the um, amount of open space on the other and mapped them side by side. So perhaps this is a way of understanding the benefits or the qualities, a new metric to think about what we do. And from the boards to reality, uh, we take this research uh, typology practice thinking um, into to, to the real world. This is a project that we're thinking through right now in Toronto, which is trying to reimagine a very dense environment, which could have been, let's say, um, entirely blocked with giant bar buildings, obscuring the views through the city and maybe creating an environment which was entirely not porous and not friendly. We tried to, let's say, multiply the amount of outdoor space so that even as we can become very efficient with the power forms, we can also provide great amenities for the public and also for the people who are living in the facilities. In Singapore, we've also uh, taken the uh, ideas into reality. This is a project called Sky Habitat that was built several years ago. Here, this is a very small site with a very high density, 508 units. And we had a lot of questions about what you could do to make the building feel very open with lots of exterior space, lots of shared communal space as well. We integrated bridges between the two buildings. All the edges of the building are stepped so that you have wonderful small balconies for all the units, but you also have really amazing terraces for the edge units, which are about 30 square meters each. So they're, they're substantial. Another uh, um, typology or, or, or study that we do here um, is, is trying to take habitat and stack it more vertically and more efficiently for these small sites while maximizing the potential of the terracing and the outdoor spaces. And so we're thinking not only about the form, but the function. We're creating these new types of um, housing arrangements. In this case, where actually there's circulation only every other floor, and these become almost like stacked townhouses, each with their own private garden. And we've taken variations of this thinking forward, for instance, in a recent project that's under construction in Quito, Ecuador. This is a 30-story uh, tower that's under construction where every single unit has a wonderful terrace. And uh, that was our guiding principle. Even on a site that was only approximately 20 meters by 30 meters in dimension, could we create a project that had equal benefits for every resident? very large external spaces that anyone can appreciate um, from their own unit. And so the overall effect of, let's say, fractalizing or breaking up the edges of the tower is quite dramatic, but it's in the spirit of creating opportunities for all unit owners.
There are other more ambitious housing uh, parties as well. Um, we call them membrane housing schemes, because also referring back to some of the studies that uh, came out of Moshe's thesis project from the 1960s. And now these push very hard on the idea of increased densities that we're finding today in the city. These are of the approach of the megastructures of the metabolists and really thinking about how to solve the challenges of the highest densities that we're finding, particularly in Asia and other countries. Not only for single use projects uh, for housing, but maybe also exploring how to solve for mixed use. Now, uh, it is the case, uh, in this case in New York, we took a small uh, cross section of the center of Manhattan and we mapped out the different uses across uh, six city blocks, um, office, residential, retail, hotels, et cetera. And we started to think about systemizing urban design schemes to integrate and merge program of office and retail and the like in, in cultural uh, um, program so that you could create um, these wonderfully fluid environments between uh, the different program and maybe a new model for thinking about the city. Now this is a diagram and not a design uh, per se, but just to take this to the uh, extreme, we did make these huge physical models to test the principles and for the highest densities to ensure that we could still achieve very large porous openings within the framework and within the system while maximizing the profiles and the stepping of them so that we could create as many units as possible with our own private garden in the sky. There are huge communal spaces at multiple levels. There's common spaces at the ground level organized around a spine, an urban axis of retail. And um, so this is us now thinking anew in a kind of an idealistic type of way around systems to approach super high density. Um, but this is working alone and to reflect, and I'm very sorry to say that the communal collective spirit of the 60s when many architects converged and came together to think, and while it wasn't always smooth sailing for them either, I would say that we have an issue today that architects don't have the correct platform to work together on large scale projects. And it's not to say that single architects need to be appointed to make huge projects across the globe, but I, I do think that we need stronger platforms to do these urban proposals together. Perversely, this project is called City Life. Uh, this project in Las Vegas is called City Center. Um, also one that it leaves a lot to be um, desired is Hudson Yards in New York. These are collections of projects of many talented architects, but without a strong thesis for how these projects add up more than the sum of the parts. And so this is a huge question for me at least as to how you create opportunities for us to come together. And, and maybe it signs that the framework of dialogue within these projects isn't quite, up, quite set up properly. Uh, one can imagine that within a framework for such a large project uh, that there's a very strong client team at the center and perhaps the um, role of the architects have been marginalized. One can only imagine um, the complexity of the arrangement between the different players here. But it's not to say that there aren't many architects out there and many architects and great thinkers that can, can come together and do great things. After all, you know, uh, Moshe and I are, you know, are teaching. We see so many talented students emerging every single day coming into the practice, we're, we're working and we're teaching in-house as well and bringing them into the fold in terms of the spirit of thinking, um, like in, in the kind of essence of what I'm talking about today. In, in some of our studios, we approach these projects to create platforms between students, between young thinkers to say that you are not alone in thinking about a tower in the city. For instance, this is a project we developed 
at the Harvard Graduate School of Design last year, which is to take a big swath of land along the Chicago River that was subject to redevelopment, take the same density and the same program, but really put the students together to create an urban design and to approach the project collectively in dialogue with their neighbors, um, as well as with the with the client. And, and we had a kind of player in the studio of clients. We had um, the whole platform team available, but we arranged it quite differently. And the results were quite interesting because at this high density, we were able to achieve a lot of diversity within the architecture, um, but within, let's say, a, a kind of larger master plan design that held everything together, gave intelligible uh, circulation that provided for quite some amount of efficiency, but um, at the same time, a lot of artistic uh, expression. And so once again, I'd like to um, point back at a wonderful document uh, that may give us some clues as to how we might work together in the future or how I might propose today would be a wonderful way of conceiving of new platforms to work together as architects or architects with urban authorities or just architects with um, singular client owner developers. So this is a document called the Habitat Bill of Rights that was put together in 1974. It was assembled for the UN Conference um, of Housing for Humanity. And the author, it wasn't a singular author, Moshe was part of this uh, representing Canada, CERT was representing the US, we had Balakrishna Doji representing India, uh, George Candelace and an architect named Ardalan from Iran, conceiving this document as a collective visionary piece and in a way a manifesto um, towards, uh, towards the same desire that I'm talking about today. Can there be a platform uh, for architects to work together collectively and add up to more than the sum of the parts? And so this document first goes through and appreciates that much architecture focuses on um, the space for the wealthy and does not conceive of wonderful spaces for all. So are there platforms that where we can come together that can um, improve the quality of life for everyone in the city? Another common theme here in the Habitat Bill of Rights is to think about doing more with less to conceive of, 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 and this is in 1970, these architects thinkers are proclaiming that we are low on resources and we must do something immediately to uh, create these buildings with less resources, but more impact to, for the, in the spirit of the betterment of society, of civilization, of, of humanity. And there's principles laid out here too, um, simple ones like, you know, the integration of green space and open space for everyone. Um, a building should be no, dent, no more dense than a certain FAR, that, you know, that housing um, developments and an enclave should only be a maximum of a certain amount of inhabitants. These are, let's say, diagrammed out as simple cartoons to um, bring home the point that it was trying to distill down principles to talk about a major urgent issue of the day. Um, I wanted to speak for, uh, finally about Singapore. Uh, I, I titled this, um, little last, uh, finale here, the city state urbanism. Um, Moshe and I, and, and the team, uh, Safdie architects have been working in Singapore for, uh, intensively for the last 20 years, but Moshe has been working there for upwards of 40 to 50 years. And this is a place where some of these principles from Siam and the collective thinkers of the 60s for urban designing and architecture come together, where some of the principles of the Habitat Bill of Rights are laid on the ground um, to see, and where the architect urban design thinker sits at the same table as the real estate developer and also the policymakers and all the contributors to projects to conceive of, of major redevelopment and technological advancement 
in, 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 in a really model city of the future. This is an article from the newspaper on the front page, um, the Straits Times, that defines the master plan vision of the city state Singapore for the year 2030. It not only examines the city center, but it examines the entirety of the country, um, carefully mapping out all the aspirations of growth and of focus and of technological innovation and circulation planning and infrastructure um, with tight integration of agency um, interaction between the Urban Redevelopment Authority, who's focused on uh, urban planning, the Singapore Tourism Agency, who is focused on forecasting and thinking about um, interaction and tourism, all other agencies, the uh, end parks, the, the parks agencies, and of course I'm simplifying, but these simple graphics that make their way to the, the cover of a newspaper are for all to see. And uh, their ambitions are quite, quite huge. Graphics like this exist on the government that are downloadable, where you can see the plans for the future. And um, you know, this is a, a map of the central business district. The, the city plan, the master plan for 2030 changes all the time. They actually commission architects to look at this together with them on an annual basis or a biannual basis. I, I, I need to put that timing up. But basically, it's constantly in flux to accommodate new philosophy, new thinking, new cultural moments, but it's always kept to date and these policies are shaping the city of tomorrow. In fact, at their headquarters, at the center of the city, the entire first level of the Urban Redevelopment Authority is a gallery space with enormous models for public consumption. It's like a museum with displays of all the aspirations of what your um, what Singapore, the place where you live, will look like in the future, and uh, it's quite a wonderful display. It's of the again a tie back to like World Expo thinking. These world these maps and and, and models are almost um, the same. You know they had the wonderful city model in New York, the New York Expo, and and this is kind of like a demonstration space of the future. Also, to the point of how it works and the dialogue between, within the industry would be that these graphics here, these represent three diagrams that are part of circulars that go out to the profession on a monthly basis or uh, very frequently. And um, we're looking at this uh, as this like, wonderful gift uh, from, from afar, being foreign architects practicing in um, Singapore. But you can see on the left-hand side, there's two diagrams here that show policy guidelines and incentives for integrating outdoor space and greenery on your building. And what they explain here is if you accommodate these types of manipulations to your architectural design, either singularly within a building or across many buildings in a district, you will receive incentives for the project, whether those be um, allowance to build slightly taller or more dense. Um, sometimes you just have to do it. And on the right-hand side of the screen is my favorite diagram, which is um, describing uh, a void deck. So the simple philosophy being that if you introduce voids in your building for communal use of a certain height, then the building can be taller in some cases or it could be more dense. You get free GFA for doing this. So in a way, what's quite unique about these policies is they make it so that innovation doesn't come from a singular author, architect, thinker. Um, it just becomes what you do. So when you have the whole profession collectively working around these guidelines and principles, you get you seek alignment. You're meeting with the agency, and they're speaking through with you exactly the motivation and across the whole city you see rapid change very quickly. And um, amazingly, the last time I was in Singapore, there was this gallery exhibition which was geared towards children at the authority agency, the URA gallery. And they invited children in to play with the guidelines and to understand the interrelationship between the built environment 
the profession, the agencies, the owners, and what it meant to um, be a smart urban designer and, and what benefit, to what benefit that would give back over time. And, and even here on the upper left-hand side of the screen, you can see the children enacting the urban design guidelines and creating their own city of the future, which is quite remarkable to us to have seen and quite um, inspiring to see that even the youngest uh, generations are being inspired to think um, collectively and collaboratively. So perhaps what I'm saying today is that we are seeking out a new platform to work together. This is not just my office in Somerville, Massachusetts. I'm very curious to, to behave and to think like the visionary humanist idealist um, folks of the 1960s, of those inspirational times where you know, we, were so, we were so visionary and we were so forward thinking, we were forecasting about those wonderful futures that were possible. Does it take creating a new manifesto like the Siam movement or some of those collect, collective agencies? I don't know. Um, does, it, does it involve a radical change of how we interact and how we position figures within the government to support smart thinking in urban design? I also don't know. Um, does it mean we change the curriculum in schools to encourage people to think together rather than individually? Does it mean we cancel the competition culture of architects where we compete to achieve, to gain work one by one building rather than um, thinking through exactly um, what the end result would be for a city? Again, these are questions um, and not answers, but uh, something that, uh, again, I wouldn't have had time to do without this wonderful invitation to, to think and to step back and to appreciate some of these trends and challenges. And really, I'd like to thank um, the conference again for giving me the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. And um, again, I wish I could be there today. And thank you uh, very much. Спасибо большое, Джеран. Если вы позволите, я задам первый вопрос, потом thanks, передам thanks lot, микрофон для коллег в зале. Вы много говорили про коллективную работу архитекторов, которые работали в 60-е и 70-е годы. With whom of the young modern architects you would like to work yourself? Uh, on joint projects or research projects to create a living environment? That's a very good question. I, well, first of all, I think I, I, the way that I'm thinking through this is I, I feel very lucky because I am working with um, Moshe and, and, and this is like an amazing part of, of and why I love um, what what I do, and I think what we, why we love what we do here, which is that we get to have this perspective on um, on architecture and urban design from, um, from from like Rudolski said, not just the the immediate um, context. And we are surrounded by many architects here in Boston, but kind of expanding the circle in space and time to think all the way back towards those inspiring moments, Expo. But frankly speaking. It, it would be quite wonderful to participate in any one of those congresses um, with with the metabolis, with Archigram, with and that would uh, you know perhaps uh, I was thinking about this this morning. Perhaps we need to create a conference, and and what would be the name of this conference? And who would we bring together, and what would we talk about, and how would that go within the way that we celebrated? develop our design work today, would it actually work? I am curious whether a conference like the SIAM Congress could be as productive today as it was, or as influential today as it was back in um, 1960s and 1950s. Спасибо, Джеран. Коллеги в зале, у кого есть вопросы? Thank you, thank you, Jerem. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience? Ни у кого нет. No Можно микрофон, пожалуйста? Uh, microphone. Здравствуйте. 
good afternoon. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Alek. I may say that uh, probably the time has come to think about something different. Uh, we are running out of oil and gas, and uh, there is another project uh, which uh, we were supposed to implement about 100 years ago. And uh, I, I would like to present that project. We may sign a contract, and uh, within 40 minutes I will uh, share the idea of that project. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jerem. It was very interesting. Uh, I personally was very much impressed to hear about your uh, work, uh, the works of soft architects, uh, which you made, uh, the bureau made for the Expo 67. And may I ask a question? Yekaterinburg uh, was nominated twice uh, uh, to host Expo. First time uh, we lost to Dubai, another time to Tokyo. What do you think? Hosting a World Expo, uh, how much important it is for a particular territory where it is organized, or it has a comprehensive impact for the general development of the habitat uh, throughout the globe? be more, uh, let's say, central to um, uh, a major leap forward for city development. So um, expos, if they can occur in the right way, and for you um, closer to home, do have the potential of really uh, remarkable uh, for the city. Спасибо большое, Джеран. Коллеги, я предлагаю поблагодарить Джерана аплодисментами. Спасибо большое. Мы были очень рады. Будем надеяться, что в следующем году вы сможете приехать к нам вживую, и мы сможем обсудить вопросы развития жилой среды уже воочию. Спасибо.